Okay, lace up those running shoes. This is going to be a pretty long, pretty dense uh, mini lesson. I'm covering probably three or four lessons worth of material. Uh, so be patient. Feel free to break this into smaller chunks. In this mini lesson, we're going to cover all the essential vocab, like every single vocab term for this next unit. Uh, as usual, I'm going to start with the flashcard definition. Those are just a few key words that are going to help you on the actual quiz. You memorize those key phrases, you'll be great on the quiz. But I'm also going to go into quite a bit of gruesome detail about application, how you try to use these terms in the actual essay. So as I said, it's going to be pretty dense and pretty long. Uh, so here we go. Essential vocab for the next essay and the next unit quiz. All right, let's start with an easy one. Uh, some of you already remember this term from ninth grade English class. Uh, we're going to make it official that the term is tone. The reason I want tone as a key vocab term that you have to know for the quiz and for the essay is in this particular essay, you've got a tone declaration section where at the very beginning you have to declare what that tone is. But let me do the basic flashcard definition first. Just remember these key words, it's the mood, personality, or emotional feel, and I might double underline the word emotional feel. It is the emotionality, the kind of mood that you get from the paper. The reason that's important is you have choice here. You have control over what you want the tone to be. Uh, everything that's written has some kind of a tone, a textbook uh, article or a newspaper article, a textbook chapter has a very specific tone. We would call that something like the objective third person tone. It's supposed to sound like nobody wrote it or it's supposed to sound like somebody with no personality wrote it. That's why your 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade English teachers did not want you using the first person I. And that's okay. I hope you learned how to use third person objective in case you have to write newspaper articles or textbook entries. For this essay, since part of the grade is coming from your own analysis, your own opinions, and your own thoughts, you will be using the first person I, and you're just going to make a conscious choice about the tone of your essay. So when you think about the tone declaration, you can have it be anything from sarcastic and snarky to kind of sincere and thoughtful, uh, or angry and hostile and aggressive. As long as you maintain that tone throughout and it more or less enhances the message of your essay, that's up to you. Part of the reason I'm doing this is it's an exercise in commitment. I want you to think about how you want the essay to feel emotionally, what kind of a tone or mood you want to have, and just be deliberate in making that commitment. I want this, to this essay to be hopelessly optimistic and, and bubbly and effervescent. Excellent. As long as you think about that ahead of time, you've played that through the entire essay, that means you're getting points for tone. Okay, for the next term, uh, I, I kind of argued with myself as to which term to use as the umbrella term. If you're going to the four-year university, I'd recommend writing down the word historiography. But for the quiz and for this unit, let's call it historical methods. And honestly, just for a flashcard definition, write down Facts feel good. It feels good to have concrete, definitive facts. I know what I'm talking about. 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. It must be true because it rhymes. Uh, so facts are kind of easy. You can memorize them. You put them on flashcards. You uh, are able to use them or recite them for your standardized quiz. So your SATs, GREs, and Regents tests that involve memorizing discrete bits of information. That's very appealing. Facts are concrete, so it feels good. Historical methods is how to cover the messy stuff, the stuff that isn't able to be neatly categorized or put into a box. So one way to think about historical methods, facts feel good, but that only gets you a small piece of history. A lot of history is going to be recorded by humans that have perspectives. Those perspectives will influence the way they document what they've seen or what they've witnessed. A lot of times you get first-hand accounts that disagree with each other. So even if it's a primary source, the primary source disagrees almost completely with another primary source. And if you wanted to run the thought experiment a hundred years from now, people are looking back on the election, and if they're looking through our journals to try to figure out what was going on on election night 2020, you're going to see a lot of conflicting information. And that's what historical methods is. It's not just saying it is a fact that the election of 2020 had as the winner, because as of right now, we don't know who the winner is, 
But that will be a fact eventually. That's something some student 100 years from now may have to memorize. Historical methods is about all the messy stuff happening at the same time. So a lot of open-ended questions, a lot of more abstract issues, things that people might argue about. Historical methods represents different ways of trying to deal with the things that are not facts. They are more open-ended. They are questions that are more theoretical or there are controversies as to what actually happened because there's conflicting accounts. Uh, some of you already might be getting nervous. Well, you're saying there's no such thing as facts. That reminds me of historical revisionism. Uh, not only the people at the times writing the history may have been biased, but then people with bias go back and change which parts of history we learn. Doesn't that lead to something like ultimate relativism? Uh, it can. And let me give you two hints for the quiz with that in mind. I still like the idea that there are such a thing as facts. And I think you can make some pretty good headway in putting together a big picture understanding of the world through history or philosophy. And that's going to be up to you to decide how to do that. But if you're anxious that, well, there's no facts, the facts are all questioned. How do I know if anything's real? Can I even prove that I exist? Uh, don't forget that for the quiz, postmodernism is always wrong because I got way too much of that in grad school. I'm always going to hate postmodernism. And postmodernism is kind of that ultimate extreme. Everything's relative. There's no good. There's no evil. Uh, all text is biased. So there's really no way to get at any facts because we might be in the matrix right now. Uh, thank goodness I don't go that far. That actually worries me and makes me as upset as it might make you. So we're trying to split the difference. Uh, facts by themselves have some usefulness. There's a bunch of history that needs some interpretation, but then there's ultimate relativism over here. And that's why any time on a quiz of mine, if you see the words postmodern or postmodernism, it's a decoy. Put a big X next to that. Postmodernism has never been a correct answer on one of my tests for as long as I'm teaching. So in the spirit of trying to split the difference between kind of ultimate relativism, like anything could mean anything, and very discrete, memorizable facts for the test, uh, I want to make facts an official vocab term, so write that down as a term that could show up on the quiz. But you don't actually have to memorize the term facts itself. I'm going to come back to that. The reason I don't like the word facts is because it's so misused right now. It's so overused. Uh, in the era of fake news, misinformation, algorithms controlling what kind of information we're exposed to, the word has been so overused it's almost meaningless. So I'm actually going to, rather than give you a definition of facts, I'm going to give you an alternate, an alternate phrase that you could use. So for the quiz, all you need to know is anytime you want to use the word fact, try to use this phrase instead. And uh, again, it's not a definition, it's an alternative. And if you remember that, that's on the flashcard, right? Uh, facts on one side. And on the other side, write down, there is a consensus among experts. Because that's really what the word fact used to mean um, about a decade ago and for the couple hundred years before that. So write that down as your definition. Facts is the vocab term. And there is a consensus among experts that whatever is true, that's a better alternative for a couple of reasons. One is it's better in an argument. If you're having a debate or you're writing a persuasive essay, it sounds a little bit more convincing because you're being clear. What you mean by the word fact is most people who know about these things agree. There isn't a lot of argument or a lot of discussion. Uh, so as an example, my favorite, because as soon as somebody writes the first flat earth essay, that's the day I quit teaching and walk out of the building and become a sheep farmer in Australia. But I'm going to maintain for now that uh, the reality of the world being spherical in shape uh, is a real fact. But let me give you two alternate ways you could say it. Let's say your argument is that the world is round and not flat. One version of that statement might be, it's a fact that the Earth is round. The reason I don't like the word fact there is it's a little imprecise, and it opens you up to an attack. So for instance, if I was arguing in the negative and you say it's a fact that the Earth is round, I could say, well, exactly what do you mean by round? Uh, with that definition in mind, this is technically a false fact. Like the way this is worded as is, you could argue that that's technically uh, not true for uh, these reasons. If you switched it out with something like, there's a consensus among experts that the Earth is roughly spherical, 
first of all, more precise, because if your definition of round is perfectly spherical, technically it's slightly bulged at the equator because of centrifugal force. So somebody who was trying to nitpick your argument, if you only said it's a fact that the Earth is round, they could say, oh, well, technically it's not a fact, and they could decide whether or not to mention that your definition of round is imprecise. And if you say there's a consensus among experts, it also shields you against the one scientist that the flat earthers have, I think it's more than one scientist at this point, that says the Earth is in fact flat. And uh, when you get to the perimeter of the Earth, uh, gradually as the gravity increases, it pushes you back. And so that's how he can prove that the Earth is flat, but still creates the illusion of a spherical Earth. So switching out the word fact with, there is a consensus among experts, makes your argument a little bit more precise and might force you to create an argument that's a little bit more airtight, it's a little bit less vulnerable to counter arguments. Mm, yum. <clears throat> okay, next two vocab terms. I'm going to lump them together, but think of them as separate and distinct vocab terms, perspectives and interpretations. Uh, clearly, you should be thinking of ways to weave them together or use them in one sentence, but just for the flashcard definition, think of perspective as a pre-existing point of view, um, pre-existing narratives and stories that you tell yourself to make the world make sense, uh, any biases that you have. Interpretations is going to be the way that you actually process the information. So you see a fact, you know, the fact is proven real, you're convinced it's real. The interpretation then is what you do with that, how you process that information. So keep in mind that interpretation is always shaped by pre-existing bias. So obviously this should sound familiar from fake news and discussions about confirmation bias. So if you remember a confirmation bias where your brain just tends to take on information that it already likes or that it already believes already has a bias towards then you're quickly going to figure out that historians and philosophers also do the same things um, they're going to try to do it less particularly philosophers try to be careful to use logic to avoid these logical fallacies like the confirmation bias but if you're a human being and you're breathing and you're not a robot you're going to have some bias, you're going to have a, some of your own initial perspectives, and those perspectives will shape your interpretation. So the perspective is the pre-existing pre point of view and bias, and the interpretation then will change based on your pre-existing bias. And just to add one more echo to confirmation bias as a concept, uh, this comic isn't perfect, but if you can see it clearly enough, uh, that it makes the point, forgive the pun, the idea is once you have something in your perspective, uh, something that you already uh, have as a pre-existing bias or just the way you see the world, this is deliberately physically showing you what that looks like. So if you imagine the rhino in this painting who is taking a picture, drawing a painting of an elephant, you see that he's painting the horn in his own face, that's part of his perspective, and his interpretation of the scene is going to be consistently warped. It's consistently changed because of his perspective. So if you know what the word perspective means in photography, it literally means the physical point of view, uh, his perspective will always include one piece of information. He doesn't even know that it's there, he just thinks it's the part of every landscape, and this is uh, in its own lighthearted way trying to make the point that all historians and all philosophers probably have the same kind of blind spots in their perspectives, just like we do. Again, if you're human and you're breathing, you have some biases, you have some pre-existing notions, you have some cognitive blind spots that by definition, you don't realize you have. All right, let's do one more easy one before we get to paradox, which some of you are going to find a little bit slippery. Uh, but let's do an easy one first. Context, only need one word. One word for the back of the flashcard. Front of the flashcard, you write context. Back of the flashcard, you write background. And that would be enough. For the quiz, just the one word background is enough. Why does it matter or why do you care? 
uh, for this essay and for the last essay this semester, it's important to realize that the context, the background of a situation, a person, um, a piece of literature, when we get to it, the background will matter. So the background includes time period, it'll include the culture that this artifact came from. If you're interpreting a text that's 100 years old and it's from Sri Lanka, you're going to treat that text differently than if it's 10 years old and it's from your friend's blog. Those are two wildly different contexts and maybe they're similar in the actual wording or the message, but you want to understand the background of where that text came from. So in other words, the background, the context of a text that you're analyzing uh, will change the way you perceive the thing in the foreground. So when you, one word, it's just that simple for the quiz. Remember that the context of a text, for instance, is just the background. And the reason that's important is the more you know about the background of anything you're analyzing, the better you can analyze it with the appropriate sense of scope. If you know the background, then you can actually get to the facts of the case more effectively. As a really depressing case study, uh, think about somebody's teenage journal. Let's make it a 13 or 14 year old girl just writing in her diary, doing uh, thoughts about boys and her life and growing up and her family, just kind of taking a literal narrative of her life. You must realize there are tens of millions of those documents out there. So there are tens of millions of texts that we could describe as angsty teenage diaries or angsty teenage journals, both in digital form and in written form. Here's what I mean when I say the context matters. Most of those won't get published. Most of those won't be famous. They might be family heirlooms. It would be nice if you can pass yours down to your daughter and she passes that on, kind of a family document. If you have any idea who this person is, that's all about context, because all she was doing was unwittingly uh, participating in what we all do, you know, a little diary, a little journal, a little daily log of events. And because of the background, the situation, the context in which she wrote that journal, and Frank is going to be famous for a long, long time, because that text was written in a very specific, very devastating, very traumatic background with a lot of historical significance, now it's not just a 13 or 14 year old's diary, it is a historical document. It's a document that not only tells you about the person, but tells you about the context of this really frightening, traumatic, and important event in history. So that's an example of how the background matters, right? If she was born 100 years earlier or 100 years later, she might have lived a long and happy life, but her diary would be meaningless since she was writing it in the context that she was writing it, suddenly that text, that document, has a lot more impact. Okay, so this is one of the terms that's going to suffer from the online delivery uh, of this particular course. This is something I'd normally spend like a gleeful two or three classes on, and I'm just going to condense all of that down into the next uh, harrowing 10 to 15 minutes. Let's talk about paradox. Start with an easy definition and then try to make my case for why that's an important term for your essay. Start with something basic, like anything that involves a contradiction or two things that are in conflict. So a statement or situation that contradicts itself to conflicting realities in one place. Uh, some of you who are kind of logically minded may find these almost offensive. You're gonna, you're gonna get annoyed at something like, let me ask you this right now. Is this statement true or false? This statement is false. Take a moment and sit with that and just ask yourself, if it was on a test and it was uh, a true or false question, how would you answer that? This statement is false, must be false because it says it is, but if it is, then it's true. In other words, if it's correct about the statement being false, that it is true because it's giving you an accurate and true piece of information. You can get really, really gross with these. Uh, visualize it and it gets a little bit more annoying. The blue button is true, the red button is false. Is that even a political statement? It can't be because it instantly contradicts itself and yet it's also true. So it's true and it's false at the same time. That is what a paradox is. That's a nature of a paradox. If you're familiar with the term oxymoron, they both have ox as part of the Latin root. And again, that just means two things that are being stuck together that shouldn't necessarily be stuck together. 
let me give you a couple more kind of uh, examples that might make it a little bit more easy to relate to. It's a very abstract concept, paradoxes are. Um, so maybe some real world examples will help. If you know anything about procrastination, procrastination kind of is a paradox on its own because you're saying, well, I don't like what happens when I procrastinate and yet I procrastinate anyway. Those are two ideas in your head at the same time. We could describe that as paradoxical as stated in this tweet, stressed out about finals, don't be. I never used to study failed exams. Did I pursue my dream anyway? No, has it worked out? Definitely not. So that's a person who knew they were doing something bad for them. They did it anyway, and the negative outcome happened. So uh, you can map this onto anything from addiction to whether or not you ate breakfast to procrastination, which is a particularly difficult paradox to break. I know that I shouldn't put the thing off because I will have negative consequences, but I'm going to do the thing because it feels good now and have negative consequences later. That could be described as paradoxical. Essentially, there's two realities in your brain at the same time. I know I should do the thing. It feels good to not do the thing, even though I know I'm going to have to pay that debt forward. That is a paradoxical thought. The original Catch-22, if you know the phrase Catch-22, that's getting at a certain kind of paradox. The uh, original, uh, the origin of that phrase is from a novel called Catch-22, and the basic paradox is this. Uh, imagine you're in World War II and you want to get out of combat duty because you don't want to die. And so you try to get yourself checked in as being mentally ill, like you're insane. So you go to the doctor, you say, look, I'm hearing voices. Uh, I, I, I'm talking to my dead grandmother in my sleep. I think I'm insane. I, you can't put me on the front lines. So the doctor sends you to a psychologist and the psychologist says, well, You'd be, you'd be crazy to want to go to the front lines. So the fact that you are so f afraid, you're so scared that you don't want to go to the front lines and risk being killed actually proves that you're sane. So we're going to send you to the front lines. In other words, you've got a contract that contradicts itself, uh, basically nullifies itself. If you're a movie nerd like me, you know that any time travel movie ever involves paradoxes. If you go back in time and killed your grandfather, your grandfather then would have never been able to have your father, so the moment that you do that should immediately wipe you out of existence. That's more of a kind of fun thought experiment type paradox. Still creates the same problem. Two things are true that seem like they should cancel each other out. Uh, if all of that's too heady for you, that's too abstract, here's a real world paradox that haunted my life for a long time and you might be able to relate to. If you've ever applied to a job, and they said, if you want to apply to this job and you want any hope of actually getting the job, you have to have two years of experience. So the catch-22, the paradox in that is, well, if I have to have two years of experience to work at a job, how am I going to get two years of experience uh, that I can use to get on the job? Because I can't get a job that will allow me to have two years of experience to apply to the job. Got it? In other words, you are immediately being asked to do two contradictory things. You have to have experience to get the job, but you also have to have enough experience so that you can get the job in the first place to have the experience to bring to the job interview. Uh, that's a real world contradiction, a real world paradox, and that slowed me down. It took about five years off my life because I had to figure out how to have two years of experience without having enough experience to get the job, to get the experience. So it's not just theoretical. You'll actually bump into some of these paradoxes in your own life. Let's go ahead and go depressing. Let's go grim. I've been keeping it light. If you or anyone you know and love has ever had in their heads a thought pattern like this, well, I know he's abusive. He seems like he's a monster, but he hits me because he loves me. That's very paradoxical. Essentially, you've got two thoughts that are in complete antithetical opposition, but they exist in the same brain. And it's probably factually true. Like an abusive person, you say, well, if you love somebody, you couldn't hit them. It's not about that they don't love them. It's about that they're a psychopath or narcissistic or they have borderline personality disorder. So they're still monstrous, but they feel the love and they, you know, explode on somebody. And of course, the outcome then is you've got a paradox in your own thinking. Well, he loves me. A is true. He also hits me. B is true. Those things are in conflict. So that relationship itself, an abusive relationship, often involves a lot of paradoxical thinking, where you have two true statements in a room together, uh, coexisting, in this case, very traumatically and very uncomfortably.
Um, since we're talking about things that are existing together uncomfortably, but that are also true, it needs to be said, our founding fathers created a document that stated all men are created equal as they had slaves competing for attention in the back. I think it was Benjamin Franklin that had the slaves that he sired with an African-American woman um, taken care of by his white children. So even in the moment of them creating the Constitution, the opportunity for abolition, the theoretically freest nation ever, they were also slaveholders. That is an essay topic. You could certainly talk about something like that because they're both true. They were pioneers of freedom and they also kept people in captivity. That would be an example of an historical paradox. So what that means for the essay is you're just trying to get comfortable embracing contradiction uh, since we're leaving the world of simple facts behind and trying to get into some of the squishier more open-ended ideas either in history or in philosophy try to embrace that try to get used to that let your brain uh, get used to doing the mental yoga it, that's required to say two true things in a row uh, George Washington is the father and founder of American freedom and he also owned people those are both true statements they seem to contradict each other and a really interesting paper is going to acknowledge both sides and ultimately try to make some intelligent conclusions okay only two more terms to go and you'll be all set for the quiz and hopefully ready to apply some of these terms on the actual essay itself steel manning uh i had a miss with that one because i del i didn't deliver i accidentally designed the first steel manning homework poorly that was just bad uh, engineering on my part the way I designed that assignment so again simple definition hopefully this is review for most of you an objective good faith underline the word good faith for the quiz that's what you're looking for is the idea that it's an honest kind of generous description of an opposing view before you tear it down before you start your counter argument it's an objective good faith attempt to summarize an opponent opponent's argument so uh, what you're listening for if it's a genuine steel man project if you're actually steel manning the alternate opinion is it should sound pretty measured it should sound uh, thoughtful and you're really trying to get at the meat of their argument as opposed to just insulting them or insulting the ideas uh, with kind of a superficial or stereotypical accusations so let me take the least political example that I can think of Again, we haven't even decided who's president right this moment, uh, but even this, I'm sure, in this current environment will strike some of you as political. One of the homeworks was try to describe the stereotype of each person, a dog person versus a cat person. So let me tell you uh, straw manning first. This is not steel manning. This is what not to do. Uh, dog people are needy and they're emotionally dependent and uh, they constantly need approval or they crumble under their own insecurity whereas cat people are aloof and pretentious and they think they're better than anybody else and they also you know like to stay away from people that's what not to do right you're attacking the personality you're attacking the stereotype and you're immediately moving into that aggressive um, deliberately insulting tone so steel manning is the opposite of that what you want to do is lay some common ground so even if you hate dogs and you want to argue that dog people are the worst, you try to start with a steel man setup where you steel man the point of view of, wow, it certainly feels good to be accepted and I really appreciate loyalty. So it sounds like you also are a big fan of loyalty and uh, how good it feels to come home to somebody that appreciates you and accepts you no matter what. So you're slowing down, you're trying to actually understand their point of view, you're trying to listen for some values that you both might share. Same thing with cats. Let's say you hate cat people. Cat people are the absolute worst. Rather than going right to the attack, lay some common ground. Independence is great. America was founded on independence, and it seems like you really appreciate the cat's independence, the cat's ability to be on its own. It doesn't uh, constantly seek attention or approval. And it sounds like you also kind of appreciate that sense of being unflappable, always landing on your feet, you know, always being able to uh, ride through something that seems chaotic with that cool uh, demeanor. So you're trying to avoid sarcasm, you're trying to avoid any personal attacks, you're trying to avoid the stereotypes, and really genuinely express the other side's point of view. For the 
quiz. All you have to remember is that it is in good faith and it is objective. For the essay, the Steel Man section is going to be no less than one paragraph in which you actually try to lay out the alternate argument. You don't have to do it from their point of view, but you do want to express their perspective and their uh, argument as intelligently and as honestly as you can uh, without the kind of vitriol and the sarcastic uh, sense of gotcha that America is literally steeped in like a tea bag right now. So try to listen for that objective, good faith tone, use that to lay the groundwork, and then you can go into attack mode afterwards, and you know you're attacking the right points. You're not just attacking the personality, you are attacking the actual argument itself. All right, last one is going to be evaluate and justify. Um, for the quiz, you could just look either of those words up in a dictionary, and, and you'll get there. But essentially what I'm looking for is uh, give me a sense of why you're using this source. Let's say you use a YouTube video um, about World War II talking about the firebombing of Dresden. And the YouTube video itself is actual stock footage from World War II. So there's no commentary, there's nobody explaining what's happening, and you're just using the video as kind of a document of the breadth of destruction, like how, how devastating the damage looked. As long as you explain, look, I'm citing a YouTube video, it doesn't have uh, much of a seeming perspective. It looks like just a video of one event, and so I actually can justify using it because I've evaluated it. Not only do I think it's legit, it also shows you, it gives you a visualization of the breadth of destruction. So you've justified it by telling me how you're using it or why you're using it in the source. And when I say evaluate it, it just means tell me why you're taking this source seriously for this point. So for the quiz, all you have to remember is that you're basically explaining why you're using a source and why you take it seriously. Um, for the actual essay itself, that's just you talking me through why you're using this video here, or you think this excerpt from a speech is important from this perspective. And as long as you talk me through the justification and the uh, presence of that source in the essay, you can use literally anything. So very wide parameters, anything counts as a source, but you have to make an intelligent case for why you're using that source in this particular section of the essay. Okay, there you have a uh, relatively brief summation of all the key vocab terms that are going to be on the next quiz. Uh, hopefully you have a little bit of a better sense of how you're applying those terms from the homework uh, to the actual essay itself. And again, I over a lot, so let me just try to bring it back down to its simplest form. Here's what the paper is all about. You're basically just showing off that you can pick one side of an argument that's already being had, either by historians or philosophers, and make your cases to which side you agree with. Um, that could be two sources that you use throughout the entire essay. You can pick and choose from a variety, a hodgepodge of different sources. As long as you evaluate and justify, anything counts as a source. And as long as you make it clear which side you're trying to support and bolster, add in as much of your own opinion, add in as much of your own analysis as you can, and just try to show off you can participate in one of these higher level arguments. That's it for now. Email with questions as usual. I'm going to try to do one last Q&A session before the quiz. And anybody who wants to uh, can join us for that. I believe it will be this coming Tuesday at 3 or 4 o'clock. Uh, so look for an email that lets you know about that. All right, see you then.